see everybody this morning on this uh, another bipolar weather day. We, uh, Mother Nature can't seem to make up its mind whether it's going to be spring or winter, but uh, we're blessed to have just a little bit of moisture as we may have forgotten what that looked like since October. So uh, we're very blessed today by our God. We're blessed to be here gathered together in this place of shelter, this warm place where we can be in comfort and we can worship God and we can focus our mind on things that truly matter. And I want to talk to you this morning about the Word, about the Word of God. And Lord willing, throughout the next few months as I have opportunity to speak, I want to continue this series uh, in talking about the Word of God, the importance of the Word of God, but also the importance of being able to understand the Word of God. And I want to start with a thought <clears throat> and, uh, and just kind of paint a picture as to why we want to go through this series of studies on rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, that was mentioned in our reading this morning that Brother John had. And uh, you might have noticed in there that Timothy, being an evangelist, was warned by Paul, also admonished by Paul, to ensure that people did not quarrel or fight over words to no profit. And that they were able to discern the things that were true from the things that were not true. And he also mentions there's a couple of men there, Hymenaeus and, uh, and Philetus, who had caused division, who had caused people to stray from the faith. And so it was important for Timothy, as a workman of God, that he would not be ashamed, that he would know the truth and be able to teach the truth so that he could help dispel some of these false teachings. That's important in everybody's life, that we know the truth, that we're able to discern the truth from what's not true. Somewhere we've lost the way. The church was designed by God to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And now what we see is a lot of different teachings of Scripture, a lot of different divisions within Christianity, if you will. And so a lot of times people ask questions about that. And I think these are good questions, but one of those questions, probably the best that I have heard, the most thoughtful is, how come there are millions upon millions of people who all study the same book and yet they're divided? That's a tremendous question. Why is there so much division in the world? And it's surrounding the way that we view God's word, the perspective that we have when we look at God's word, our perspective on the authority of God's word. And I will tell you, it was not God's plan. It was not his design for us to be divided. It was not his design for us to fight and quarrel. It was not God's design for us to believe and practice different things. But see, God gave us his word as a blueprint for our life. He gave it for us so that we could look at it and we could, we could found our life upon that word. But if we don't understand how God's word works, we're going to draw different conclusions when we read the Bible. So, revisiting this passage from 2 Timothy 2.15, I want to bring some things out from just this one passage for a moment. This is a very common word to us, the word study. We, we, we learn about study when we start uh, in school, and, and we look at the word study as though we're opening something and we're examining it for a long time and carefully uh, examining that. And, and that's really the idea that's being given here. Now, the word study itself here uh, in the Greek probably doesn't mean what we would think study means. It actually means be diligent. But if you think about what Paul's telling Timothy here about uh, not striving about useless words and about knowing the truth, obviously the idea of diligence here is surrounding the Word of God. So study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that he doth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. This, these two English words, rightly dividing, come from one Greek word, orthotomeo, which literally means to make a straight cut. You notice the word dissect there. That's something very familiar to us, to dissect, to, to split something in two very carefully, very surgically. And you notice in the parentheses, it says expound. So to dissect correctly, that is to expound. Let's talk about expound for a minute. This is especially important concerning Timothy's work because the idea of expounding means to explain something. Notice to lay open, to lay open the meaning, to clear of obscurity. 
to interpret or to expound a text of Scripture, to expound a law. I want to think about this for a moment when we think about rightly dividing. To clear from all obscurity. You ever look at something and you, and you, you can kind of tell what it is, but, but, but it's obscure. It's, it's, it's not really easily discernible. So you have to get a closer look at it. You know, maybe sometimes something so small that, that you have to get out a microscope and, and very carefully examine it. That's the idea. To not just look at God's word from 10,000 feet, if you will, but to get up close and get personal. To look at it carefully, to examine, to investigate, if you will. Why? So that we can make sure that not only we know the truth, but we're telling others the truth. That's the idea of expounding here. 1 Timothy 4.16, notice the relationship here. He says, take heed to yourself and the doctrine or the teaching or that which is taught. Continue in them. Notice, continue in them. What's them? Yourself and the teaching. There's two things he says take heed to. Yourself and the teaching. For in doing this, you will both save yourself and those who hear you. Now, don't misunderstand what Paul's saying. He's not saying a person can save themselves, like justify themselves, redeem themselves. Not that type of salvation. But what he's saying is this. Truth is so important that your salvation is teetering on the balance. So you have to watch yourself. Pay close attention to yourself. Also pay close attention to the doctrine. And that will not only affect your salvation, Timothy, but it will affect those you teach. As a teacher, it is so important that when we teach, we clear from all obscurity. If we get up and we teach things and people leave more confused than they were than we got here, we did not do our job. Our job is to expound the Word of God, to teach it clearly. Why? Because it's important not just for ourselves that we know the truth, but that we teach the truth because it affects everybody within earshot. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verses 7. As per usual, I will butcher these names. Let's not worry about the names. Uh, they're probably not in the Hebrew the same they are in the English anyway, so... Uh, but I want us to notice something here. When, when Israel was gathered around and they were reading the law of God, they weren't just reading the law of God, but there were men there who had the responsibility of not only reading God's word, but doing something else with God's word. So Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Achab, Shebathai, Hodijah, Maasia, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peleiah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book and the law of God and they gave the sense and helped them understand the reading. These men that were reading the word of God, what did they do? They not only read the word of God, then they gave the sense. What's that mean? They explained the meaning. They expounded the law of God. Why? To help people understand the law. Now why is it so important that people understand? Because you can't follow something you don't understand. Friends, our first desire in life, our number one desire in life should be to please God. And God's told us how to do that. He's told us how to please Him. He's revealed that to us in His Word. But if we don't understand His Word, how can we possibly please Him? See, these people understood it's not good enough just to read the Word to people. They explained it so people could understand it. And every one of us have some responsibility to understand what we can understand in God's Word. Acts chapter 17 and 11. <clears throat> now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the Word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if those things were so. If that wording looks a little different, this is from the English Standard Version. And I put this up there because of the word eagerness, because that is actually the, the literal definition of the word that we typically read that says with all readiness. They were eager to receive, to hear God's word, but their eagerness did not just stop with eagerness. You can be very eager to hear and just get yourself in trouble. If you're so open-minded, you're just ready to listen to any view and everything, and you don't stop, 
and examine that, you could get yourself in real trouble. But these people were noble in that they had an eagerness to learn. They had a desire for more. They were hungry. But they also got out their microscope. And they examined the scriptures to make sure that what Paul and others were teaching was actually the truth. There's a nobility in that. And each one of us has a responsibility to do this right here, to examine the scriptures daily. So, someone says, well, I've tried that. I'm not getting much out of it. I, I don't understand things. And I want you to know something. That is to be expected. You know, the Bible tells us not everybody's a teacher. James tells us that. Be not many masters, knowing that we will all receive a harsher condemnation and also... <laughs> Uh, we also offend all or we lead astray. And so we have to be careful about not everybody being a teacher. But there are men who have devoted their lives to studying God's word. There are women who have devoted their lives to studying God's word and they're able to teach. And, we, and if we, we're having trouble understanding those things, well, guess what? God's put us within a body of believers. And Monty Paul talked about that in his prayer today. That we're together, and just because we don't understand something, God didn't say, hey, look, you got to figure it all out on your own. you got to go figure it all out on your own. I'm going to tell you something. I could not do that. I'm very thankful for all the generations before me, the men who study God's Word that help build foundations for things I don't even have to investigate because they taught me. All the teachers here could say the same. They learned things from, from the men of faith that were before them. If we don't understand, then there's people to help. There's people to help. But I want us all to have some type of framework to understand how God's Word works so that when we do go to the Bible and we look at the Bible and we seek to understand it, how is it that God's Word works? And I'll tell you, it's, it's different from just a regular book that men may write. For one thing, if I was to write a book to you, I would start at the beginning and go to the finish and I would try to probably keep all of my thoughts in some type of order. But what you have in the Bible is not one person writing, but many people writing. It's a collection of over 60 books written by different men from different eras, in different times with sometimes different laws. And some of it's history, and some of it's law, and some of it's wisdom. And there's, there's just a lot there. And so how is it that God's Word works? Well, we don't have to really... Be curious about that because God is going to tell us how his word works in his word. And so what we're going to talk about is hermeneutics. And I know that's a strange word probably to a lot of people. What in the world is hermeneutics? Well, it's the art of finding the meaning of an author's words and phrases and of explaining it to others. We use hermeneutics in about everything that we examine or read. If you're, if you're an English teacher and you're teaching uh, uh, literature to, to children, a lot of times they have to understand what type of book they're reading. So if somebody's reading something like Aesop's Fables and they're reading about, you know, a fox that can walk on its hind legs and talk and, 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 and use logic and, and do all those things, well, they have to understand something about that book, right? It's personification. It's uh, anthropomorphism, I think is the right word, where you give human characteristics to things that don't have human characteristics. So there's an understanding about the way we interpret the book. It's not meant to be taken this way. It's a work of fiction or maybe an analogy or maybe it's figurative. Well, would you be shocked to hear that the Bible has some of these things in it? It does. And so we ha there's a method used to interpret Scripture. And there's sort of this pendulum, this extremism of truth, if you will, that people often go into God's Word with these preconceived notions. And one of those preconceived notions is that everything in the Bible is literal all the time. Is everything literal? No, it's not. Most of it's literal. But you know, you go read Joseph's dream, uh, or rather Joseph's interpretation uh, of Pharaoh's dreams, and, and you read about these skinny ears of corn eating fat ears of corn. And is that literal? Well, no, it's not literal. There weren't these famished cows eating fat cows. It, it didn't literally happen. And you have to read the narrative to understand it's a dream, it's a vision, it's a symbol. There's lots of symbols in the Bible. There's lots of signs in Scripture. 
the book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation. There's signs and symbols. There's all different types of things in the Bible. And so having this extreme view can get us in trouble. Okay, I'll give you another one. Everything in the Bible is true. Not necessarily. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. No, hold on. Hear me out. Thou shalt not surely die. Who said that? Satan. Was that true? No, it's not true. He was lying. Yes, the Bible is a true record of things that happened. But there's important questions to ask when reading Scripture. Who's talking? Who are they talking to? Are they inspired? Okay, the book of Job tells us that. You read the words of Job's friends. If you're going to go and look at what uh, Elihu or Bildad or Zophar said to Job, and you're going to try to create a doctrine based on things they said, you'll get yourself in trouble because God said at the end of the book, what they said was wrong. So we have to be careful about just grabbing a piece of text and taking a hatchet and going and cutting things out. We need a scalpel to rightly divide God's Word, to be precise. There's another extremism, and that's this. Well, <clears throat> I just can't believe the Bible's true because I've always believed this and the Bible says something different. And you go in thinking you already know what's true and so nothing matters. And somewhere in the middle of those things you're going to find some truth. But if you take an extreme position and you don't understand how God's Word works, you can read it all day long and it will never benefit you. It won't benefit you. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 28. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? That's the question of the morning. Who can understand God's word? Who is it that God's going to teach? And then he answers that question. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Again, this is not a literal statement. He's not saying, well, when a baby is weaned, then they'll understand God. That's not the point. The point is this. It takes a level of maturity for us to understand doctrine, to understand God's Word. You know, there's more passages that talk about this. In fact, the Hebrew writer, this is some 800 years after Isaiah uh, penned those words in Isaiah 28. The Hebrew writer says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to those that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay, so we're talking about rightly dividing or rightly discerning the things that we want to know from the things that may not be necessarily true. So we've got that down at the bottom of this passage. But notice the process. There's people, he says, that use milk, and he said they're unskillful. What does the word skill mean? What do you think of when you think of someone that's skillful? I'll give you an example of that. Cooking. Something familiar to all of us. Food, okay? We're talking about food. We like to talk about food. We think about food a lot. You know, cooking is a skill. And you say, oh, no, 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 you can just get a recipe, follow the recipe. You go, well, not always. I've seen people follow a recipe, and what comes out looks very different. Very different from what the recipe says. But I'll tell you, there's some people that don't need a recipe. My mother-in-law does not need a recipe. She's been cooking. She cooked in a restaurant for over 50 years. And I'll tell you, that woman is skilled when she cooks. She doesn't have to measure. And I'm like, how do you know that's right? I just know. Well, how do you know? I just do. Well, I'll tell you how she knows. Her senses have been exercised to discern. She knows when she takes the bag of flour and she pours it out, she goes, okay, that's a cup and a half. I look at it, I go, that's a big old amount of flour. But she's done it so much that when she looks at it or she picks something up and feels it, her senses have been exercised to make those discernments. How does that happen? By reason of use. It's, it's real simple. It's about muscle memory. It's about the more that you handle something, the more you use something, the more familiar you become to it, and then all of a sudden, your senses become exercised. What does that mean? It means the more that we use God's Word and the more we use it rightly, the easier and easier it's going to get to discern those things. 
Look, if we don't pick up God's word and we don't use it, our senses are not going to become exercised. Our maturity is never going to grow. We'll just be a babe. You know, there's, there's something to know about babes. Babes, they just can't handle the strong meat. Now, do we know this? Sure we do. I mean, any parent who feeds a baby understands what the baby needs. But what's the problem? That's a good Texas picture, right? Start them young. Well, you'll kill him is what you'll do. You'll kill the baby. Number one, he probably doesn't have the teeth to chew it. Secondly, he probably can't swallow it. Thirdly, if, even if it gets to the digestive system, the digestive system is not mature enough yet to be able to digest what goes in. So what do you do? You give them milk. You say, okay, we get it. That's ridiculous. I get it. That's ridiculous, isn't it? You know what's just as ridiculous? That's ridiculous, isn't it? You know what the problem is here? Now, the grown person doesn't have the same problem as the baby. The grown person can swallow the milk, digest the milk, unless you're like me and you're lactose intolerant to some extent. But he can digest the milk, get the nutrients from the milk, whereas not much is going to happen over here except for problems. The biggest problem is malnutrition. This is not enough. It doesn't give him what he needs to really grow. And I'll tell you, not that he's concerned about growing, but you get the point. Milk is not enough nutrition for somebody who is mature, who is grown. You need more than milk, is my point. You need more than milk. And just like we're not going to try to cram a piece of meat down a baby's throat, we shouldn't be satisfied as older people who have the cognitive ability to understand God's Word. We shouldn't be satisfied with just having milk. You need meat. You need meat. And it's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort, and it's going to take some understanding to be able to eat the meat. But we all need meat. Going back to Isaiah, Isaiah, the first part, he talks about maturity. The second part, he says, precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. You said, man, that's really repetitive and really redundant. That's the point. That's the point he's making. As I said earlier, God's Word, it doesn't start with Genesis and then it follows a timeline where every truth is just laid out in sections. Like, uh, you know, you try to go look and see, well, what is faith? And you go and you find this section in the back of the Bible and it says faith and you go to this page and there's this big, long reading of several pages that just has this explanation of what faith is. It doesn't work that way. How does it work? Well, we're introduced to the idea of faith. We're introduced to that idea really probably best uh, in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel and the offering that they made. Well, we don't even know that that's what faith is until we get to Hebrews and he says, by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Oh, we go, oh, well, that was faith. Well, let's go back and look at it and learn from it. And you've got to pile all these layers everywhere. And so precept upon precept. Well, here's the other problem with that. If you're trying to find out what the truth is and divide the word of truth and you start leaving a lot of these layers out that are spread all over scripture, you're going to have a very narrow idea about the truth and you're not going to know the whole truth. You know, there's a reason why, why we try to examine the whole of an evidence before we make a judgment. There's a lot of evidence. You say, that sounds like a lot more work. It is. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And you may think, well, I don't have time for that. We've got a lot more time than we give ourselves credit. I'll tell you, I've got a lot of time to study God's Word. But sometimes I'd rather not. Just being honest. Sometimes I'd rather do something else. Maybe I want to go play golf or watch TV or just sit there and fiddle with my phone for a little while or, or just do nothing. And then I go, well, you know, I wish I'd have time to do that this week. Well, I had lots of time. I just put something else in that time slot, and that way later on I could just make excuses about it and say, well, I just don't have time. We've got time. And you say, well, what if I don't learn enough before time runs out? Well, guess what? God will take care of that. God knows you don't have any more time than you really have. But I'll tell you what he also knows. That he's given us his will. And he's told us 
to learn His will. And He's given us a mind to read that will and understand that will. He knows those things. And He expects us to try and to put our desire toward Him. And to love Him and to love His ways and to love His precepts and to learn His precepts. Yes, it's work. But I'll tell you, it's a blessing. You'll grow. You'll be enriched. Your life will become much easier. The more and more you learn, the more you grow and the stronger you will be. This truth that we have is layered. I want to give you a a real visual example of just how layered the truth is. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the very first prophecy in Scripture that was given concerning Jesus Christ. 4,000 years before Jesus actually would die. Now, do you think when Adam and Eve and the serpent heard the word of God right here, that they went, I know exactly what that means. Jesus is going to come and he's going to stomp the heel of the devil. And when he stomps the heel of the devil, the devil's going to bite his heel and he's going to die on the cross for our sin. They didn't understand any of that. All they had was this very obscure prophecy that would not even be connected till later on. All they knew is there's a seed of the woman that's coming and something important is going to happen regarding the devil, the serpent. That's all they knew. But you know, Paul connects some of those dots later in Galatians 4 and 4. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the sun. Let me ask you a question. How many people that were born were made of a woman? Everyone, right, except for Adam and Eve. Everybody that's been made has been made of a woman. Why say made of a woman? Well, Jesus came to live in flesh. That tells us two things. One, He was made of a woman, which we'll talk about in a second, but also that... That this is God come in the flesh. He came in a human body, was made of a woman. But you know, it's very rare to tie someone's genealogy, their physical genealogy, to their mother. Go look through scripture. What you see is people are always connected to their father. Their father beget this and this and this. But Jesus is connected for some reason to a woman here. To a, well, why is that? Well, you probably already know, right? You've, you've had the spoiler alert. But we're looking at the layers here. So this... Revelation of this prophecy from Genesis 3, 4,000 years later. That's a long time for a layer, isn't it? Isaiah chapter 7, 14. This is about 750 years before Paul, or about 800 years actually before Paul wrote it, in Galatians chapter 4, where he says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. What's that tell us? Well, now we know why it's connected to the woman. There's not going to be a father. There's not going to be a physical father. This isn't like other births. No one's ever been born of a virgin except Jesus. Not only is it a huge sign, but it's a huge adding to this layer. Then we find out in Luke chapter 1 when that was fulfilled about 750 years later. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. Now we know who the woman is that was spoken of in Genesis chapter 3. It wasn't Eve. It was Mary. Well, how could that be? The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Jesus would not have a physical father. He would be the Son of God. God would be his father. Well, that's, that's a lot to go through. Well, that's just scratching the surface. But again, those things are layered in different books throughout the Bible. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, but when you put them together, you see the whole, don't you? You see the whole, you get the whole picture. And that's part of rightly dividing God's word, is being able to look through those layers and find out which layers fit. Sometimes the layers don't fit. Just because the word faith is in this passage and the word faith is in this passage doesn't mean they're teaching about the same thing. Just because the word works is over here and the word works is here doesn't mean the layers fit. You have to look at the context. You have to understand what's being said. Sometimes we can try to align the layers and they don't line up. It's kind of like taking a puzzle and you've probably all done a puzzle and you're looking for this certain piece in the middle of this deal where everything is the same color. 
That's frustrating for me. I don't have the patience for that. Kennedy can sit there all day and try different pieces. I come in there, I've turned about 10 pieces. I go, okay, I need a break. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you find a piece that looks like it looks like it'll fit. And if you push hard enough, it'll go in there. <laughs> and then you start trying to put pieces around it, and you realize that wasn't the right piece at all. It doesn't fit on all four sides, even though it fit on that one side. We've got to be careful not to do that with God's Word. Just because we can shove it in there and make it look like it fits doesn't mean it fits all the way around. And we've got to be very careful about how we layer God's Word. Deuteronomy 29 and 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. I'm just going to guess that most of us are very curious about the unknown. I am. There's a lot of things that I don't know that I would love to know. And at times I've, I've, I've you know, talked to people and we'll talk about various things, you know, regarding the creation of man and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's fun to talk about, but the truth is we don't know. God didn't tell us. And, you know, you can get carried away with this and spend so much time trying to figure out the secret things, the things God hasn't revealed to you, and putting all of your focus and attention on those things, which you'll never know, by the way. And it'll take away from the attention and focus that you should have on the things that God has revealed to us. Why would we spend our times trying to figure out the mysteries, the things God hasn't told us, when God has told us so much that we still don't understand? See, that's what we need to focus on. Because those things don't belong to God. They belong to God and to us because He's given them to us. Why? So we can understand and we can follow His will. I want you to know something. You may feel like there's things God didn't tell you. And you may get frustrated about that and think, why didn't you tell us this? But you have more privilege from God than anybody else who's ever lived. And I want to tell you why. Because the people that grew up in the Jewish nation, Israel... There's a lot of things they wish they'd have known that they didn't, but you do. This is what Paul says. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. How that by revelation, that is, God told me through the Spirit, He made known to me the mystery. What's the word mystery? It means something that was kept secret. That's all it means. That's all the word mystery means, something that was kept secret. It wasn't revealed yet. He says, as I have already, or I have briefly written already, by which, what I've written, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul said, there was this mystery, something that God knew that we did not know, but God revealed it to me through the Holy Spirit. And now I've written it down so you can know what I know about that mystery. There's a lot that you know about the mystery that other people have not been privileged to know. God's revealed to you something. Something belongs to you that hasn't belonged to others. And he said, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit or by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. We, we probably take this for granted, but it's a wonderful blessing. And we did not choose this blessing. It's a wonderful blessing to live on this side of the cross of Jesus. To know the reality of God's mercy. To know the reality of His grace and His salvation and the hope of heaven. And, and those things are realized for us. They weren't even known. Not only by the people, but also by the prophets. The prophets that prophesied of, of Christ's coming and the grace that was coming. They didn't even understand it. Notice what Peter says in 1 Peter 1. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So they prophesied about what we know, the mystery today. But notice what else it says about these men who were inquiring and searching carefully. They were studying. They were examining. But you know what they found? Obscurity. Look at this. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. You go read Isaiah chapter 53 and you read those passages about Jesus being rejected of man, wounded, bruised, his stripes, healed us. All those things, you read them and you know what they mean, don't you? You see Jesus in Isaiah 53. Why? Because we've already seen Jesus' death. When Isaiah wrote it, 
You know what he was doing? What is this? What is this about? When is this going to happen? He didn't know. He was just writing what the Spirit told him to write. The Spirit of Christ was in him. It was indicating what would happen. But he didn't understand it, but you do. Because you've seen the layer. You've seen the picture. And all the shadows line up with the picture. Not because you lined them up, but because God lined them up in His Word through His wisdom. To them, that's these prophets, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Even the angels are interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because they didn't get it either until it happened. Then they knew and understood. Do you feel privileged to know that information? To have those things revealed to you? Because if you don't, I want you to know you are. You're very privileged. And it's a humbling thing to me to read that all these things that these prophets were writing about, it wasn't for their sake, it was for our sake. They were ministering to us thousands of years before we ever came. So let's go back to this thought as we start to wind down our thoughts about discerning taking effort. Timothy was taught the scriptures from childhood. And that's what Paul tells him. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which was in Christ Jesus. I think sometimes we can take that for granted as well. We say, well, you know, I, 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 know, I know quite a bit. I, I know enough. I, I mean, I've been in church since... I was, you know, baby, I mean, I've heard a lot of things. Well, you know, Timothy obviously wasn't in church since he was a baby, but he had a mother and a grandmother, Lois and Eunice, who taught him the Word of God. He learned the Word of God from the time he was a child. But then he was admonished this by Paul, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Timothy knew a lot, but here's what Paul said. You know a lot, but not enough. I want you to give attendance. That word give attendance means to hold the mind toward. I realize that print is really small. To hold the mind toward, that is pay attention to, be cautious about, apply oneself to, adhere to. Let me give us a, a, a good analogy to think about this idea of holding your mind toward something so that we don't lose the point. As dads, we are stereotyped and probably rightly so for not paying enough attention to our kids when mama leaves them alone with us you know especially with olivia when she was little you had to pay strict and close attention to olivia because it did not take long before disaster happened i mean calmness could go to a cataclysmic event in five minutes maybe less uh you know, if you're not careful, she may end up on the bathroom sink, perched up there like a bird with black nail polish painting your teeth. For the record, I was not home when that happened. But there were a lot of other things that did happen on my watch. And so Toya would get home, she'd say, where's Olivia? I'd be like, she's right over, I don't know. I thought you said you'd watch her. Well, I, you're right. <laughs> I didn't, you know. I was, I was doing my thing, and, you know, if I thought, well, if any loud noises, I'll go check on her. Well, is that paying attention to something? Is that holding your mind toward it? Is that adhering yourself? No. You get the point, right? Okay, just because we read God's Word from time to time doesn't mean we're holding our mind toward it, that we're focused on the spiritual things. Just because we have a spiritual thought once in a while. What Paul said was, I want you to give attendance to reading, attendance to exhortation, attendance to to doctrine hold your mind toward those things focus on them bible study does not end when the book closes you say what bible study doesn't end when the book closes sometimes we can overwhelm ourselves with reading too much and not understanding anything you know be better read a little close the book and think about it Meditate on the Word. Hold your mind toward it. And I'm going to tell you, things will change. 
through that reason of use, your senses will become exercised. You'll start to notice things you didn't notice before. You'll pick up on things that you wouldn't have without that. Some people think the Bible is too complicated complicated in fact the skeptic will say I can't believe in a God that gives his will to man only for man to have to spend his entire life having to analyze and study his will to understand it in other words God's not a good communicator he's too complex it's a waste of time you know it's interesting I don't hear anybody saying that about quantum physics that's the study of matter and energy and I'll tell you we have put billions of dollars and countless hours into studying quantum physics, and we still know very, very little. It's extremely complex. Chemistry. Chemistry is extremely complex. And again, we've spent hours and, and billions of dollars trying to learn about chemistry. And I'll tell you, chemistry enriches our lives. A lot of the medicines that we take are the result of good, studied, funded chemistry. And it's complex. So is calculus. And uh, Monty Paul's probably thinking, calculus is not that complex. It's very complex to me. It looks like a foreign language. Some people understand it. Some people are gifted with it. Some people are not gifted with it, but they understand it. You know why? Because they put in the time to understand it. But it's a very complex system. And here's my point. You know, we have a God that is far more complex than quantum physics, than chemistry and calculus. And I'll tell you why. Because those things exist from his mind. Not only does he understand them, he created them, he designed them, he put them in order. The mind of God is complex. And, and we don't question the complexity of things that we see within the creation because we understand they're complex. But then we think, well, you know... Obviously, I can't believe in God. That would be too complex. We expect the creation to be more complex than the creator? I'll tell you what the Bible is. It's the mind of God revealed to you. Why would we be surprised that that is complex? There are things about God's creation I don't understand. Many things. Even the things we think we do understand, God probably goes... Yeah, you're getting close, <laughs> but you, don't, you just don't get it yet. Here's what God said. My thoughts are not your thoughts. We've read that before, haven't we? Let this really sink in. When I try to think about what God thinks, eh, no, his thoughts are not my thoughts. Just because you think something doesn't mean God thinks that. Doesn't mean he thinks that way. And that's hard for people. They would say, well, I, I could never love a God that would, and then just finish the sentence. Okay, but understand something. God is not your thoughts. His thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways are not your ways. God does not align himself or shape himself according to what you think in your mind. He is who he is. And we don't need to look at the Bible to, to find out whether or not we like who God is. We need to find out who God is and align ourselves with Him. But His thoughts, they're complex. He says, not only are they complex, not only are they above you, as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, Toya's not here today, and she may or may not listen to this, so I'll just go ahead and tell you something I really don't want her to know, but she's smarter than me. She's taken tests. I've seen the results. There's proof. You know, she's not smarter than me about everything, but most of that is because of experience. But she is smarter than me. She's very intelligent. She's not twice as smart as me, though. But she is smarter than me. But I don't know if you know this or not, but God is smarter than you. And not only is he smarter than you, he's smarter than you as the heavens are above the earth. Let's take something that's relatively close to the earth as far as the heaven space is concerned. Let's just take our sun. You say, that's not very close. In perspective of the universe, it's rather close. And it is about that far away. How much smarter is God than us? We can't even quantify it. We can't even know. You know why? Because the only thing we know about God is what he said. Okay, you can understand this. So I'll tell you this. You ever felt that way? 
you know, somebody's a lot smarter than you, and you go, man, everything they said just goes, whoo, like that. So what do they do? They dumb it down for us. And I'm thankful for all you smart people that dumb it down so I can understand it. But I think we have to understand it about God. In a lot of ways, God's dumbed it down so we can understand it. And so what we think is complex is probably not complex to God. But it is complex to us. And he's, he's, he's told us that. It's going to be complex. You're going to have to search. You're going to have to study diligently. You're going to have to get help. You're going to have to talk it out with other people who, who are also searching. Acts chapter 8, verse 30. So Philip ran thither to him. I'm quoting the King James. He ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? I'm afraid sometimes we would be insulted by such an insinuation. Do I understand what I'm reading? What if that man would have said that? What do you mean, do I understand? What do you call me, dumb? You think I'm senseless? That's kind of the world we live in, right? What's this man say? And, and understand, this is not a peasant. This, this man is the treasurer for a queen. He's not uneducated. He lives in the center of education in the world in Egypt. And what's he say? No, I don't. I don't understand what I'm reading. How can I accept someone guides me and he asked Philip to come and sit with him this is what we need we need to have such a hunger for understanding that our pride gets sacrificed we say you know what I need help with this I don't understand what I'm reading what do you think maybe they don't understand what they're reading well guess what maybe they can go find a person to sit next to both of them but I'll tell you, if this man had had the attitude we often have, which is, oh, I ain't going to say I don't know. Well, I don't understand it, but I'm not going to tell them I don't understand it. You know what this man had? A desire to please God. That's it. He was reading it. He didn't understand it. He said, Philip, come sit up here and help me with this. Paul understood this. Last passage of the day, Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. I want to leave you with something to think about. Paul, in writing to the church at Ephesus, says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Do you see a distinction made there? Two different ways that Paul taught. Publicly and from house to house. Why did Paul teach house to house? Because publicly, while good, while helpful, was not enough. It wasn't enough. He also went into homes. He did what we would just roughly call Bible studies. They studied the Bible in homes. It wasn't just, they didn't feel like, well, you know, we're going to go for our weekly meal. No, they were hungry. And Paul fed them. I want you to know something, friends. If you're hungry... There are men here, there are women here, who would love to study the Bible with you in your home. If you want to learn more, if you want to grow more, you want to have a greater understanding of God's Word, there are people here who can help you. All you have to do is tell them. Now, there's no shame in that. You know, there's no shame in saying, hey, you know, I've been struggling with the Bible, I'd like some help. There's no shame in that. The shame would be if we go, well, I don't understand it, but I'm sure too prideful to tell anybody that and get help. We all have help. We all have help. We all need help. We all need each other. But we can learn and we can grow. And God has put us together in a body so that we can do that very thing. You can understand God's word. That ball is in your court. So are we hungry? Are we seeking? Today we offer the invitation of Jesus Christ. If you have heard about the mystery of Jesus Christ, you understand that mystery, but you're not a partaker of that gospel. If you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we want to offer the invitation this morning so that you can do that. If you have obeyed the gospel and you need prayers for anything at all, for strength, for comfort, if you've got sin in your life and you want us to take that need before God, we'd like to help you with that. Come and have a seat on the front row as we stand and we sing.